don't know if you guys pay attention to the words that we sing when we sing, but that last song is great, if you ask me. It's, uh, I like it because it runs so contrary to the, you know, the American mindset that Christianity is going to be wonderful. And then here we're singing down here, God, if you kill me, that's okay. You ruin me, I'm in. Um, reminds us of what Christianity is all about. It's about our devotion to the Lord because of his devotion to us. Um, well, today we're talking about uh, some things in Scripture before us right here in Luke chapter 12, um, as was already read. I won't read it again, but we'll go through it verse by verse. And the title of this message is The Scariest Thing in the World. Now, we're all familiar with fear. There isn't a single person in this room who hasn't felt it, dealt with it. Um, but we all have different sources of fear. Uh, not everybody's afraid of the same thing. Uh, what are you afraid of? Spiders. Huh? Spiders? Yeah. Dark. Airplanes. Public speaking. Different things like that. If you consider what worries you more than anything, then you understand what fear is. And today we're going to be dealing with the issue of fear. Jesus is going to narrow it down into two very clear categories, fearing man or fearing God. And the illustration on the television, if you know anything about art history, this is the uh, Michelangelo, uh, the creation of Adam uh, painting. And if we panned back, you would see there's a man over here and God over here, and this is where the two fingers touch. And I think this is an appropriate illustration for whatever you would, uh, whatever category you'd fall into. Uh, either you fear man or you fear God. And Jesus says as much in verse 4. He says, I say to you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more than that they can do, but I'll show you who you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Clearly, we can choose. We fear man or we fear God. And we get into the text and we learn in the first verse that the crowds are continuing to grow. Jesus, being a few months from his crucifixion, has gained a lot of popularity in the community and in that uh, country and region. And people are coming out to um, see Jesus for various reasons. I mean, this says that the crowd was so big that they were stepping on each other. I mean, this is like state fair on Labor Day, right? Worse. Uh, this is people getting trampled. This is mob mentality. Uh, and so here you have this happening with superstar Jesus. The reason why he's so popular um, is manifold. Uh, one reason is, is because he was, as I've always said, he gives out free health care. Anybody that gives out free health care is going to have an audience. And, and he's healing people left and right, never turning anybody away, always, you know, uh, curing people of diseases. He's casting out demons, which would be quite the magic show, uh, quite a thrilling thing to watch if you're one that's given to entertainment. This would be better than any movie that uh, 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 Spielberg has done or, or, or Cameron. This is the best of the best. You're watching great displays of power that you've never seen before. Um, upon occasion, he gives out free food. Free food always draws a crowd. Okay, so there's various reasons why people are coming out there to see Jesus in such great numbers. But one of the reasons now at this point, toward the end of his ministry, is because they're all trying to get close enough to see the dispute that's taking place between this itinerant Jewish carpenter and the Pharisees. See, these Pharisees held such a prominent position in their communities and in their culture that you would never do battle with them. What they say goes. The scribes and the Pharisees, when they pass laws, you don't argue. When they say something, it's done. They are important. Anybody who challenges them, it's like challenging God. And then here comes this carpenter from Nazareth walking around doing all this stuff and constantly getting in their faces because they're getting in his. That'll draw a crowd. 
That was UFC before there was UFC. You want to watch a fight? Go to where Jesus is and you'll see some awesome show. And that's exactly what's happening here. They're trampling on one another to get a good seat. And so Jesus, in, when it says that the innumerable multitude, just to give you an idea, we're talking about tens of thousands of people. And the average town and city in that day, um, you know, 80 people, 100 people, few hundred people. So to gather together tens of thousands means people are coming from everywhere. All of them. And they're stepping on one another to get in close to hear what's being said. And here's what Jesus does. He turns to his disciples, first of all, and he says this, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Leaven means yeast. When you start thinking yeast, you get a, 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 an idea of the, uh, the uh, symbolism there. Yeast is, of course, that which you work into bread dough when you're baking that kind of permeates the, the dough that you're working with, causing it to rise. Yeast grows. Okay, and, and so Jesus used this idea of leaven being sin in his teaching. Um, it's also found in the Old Testament where God at Passover requires that all Jewish peoples um, observing Passover remove all the leaven um, not just from their meal, but from the house. Get rid of the yeast. Purify the home. Purify the self. Get rid of the sin. So Jesus carries that idea over into the New Testament, and he starts calling the teaching of the Pharisees, the things they teach, sinful. Their hypocrisy, sinful. See, it's not necessarily that what they were teaching was, was terrible. It's that they were teaching this, but living this. That's what hypocrisy is. A hypocrite, the, the definition of hypocrite is an actor playing a role. And he calls these Pharisees actors. They're pretenders. They're not the real thing. They say they love God. They say they adhere to the scriptures. They preach it like it's true. They're hypocrites. They're actors. They pretend outwardly to be devoted to God's service but on the inside, secretly dishonoring him through unrepentant sin. What sin? We don't know, because it's secret. That's how that works. See, it's been happening since the beginning of time, people coming into the religious world or to the, the supposed God-honoring realm, you know, on the outside looking like they play the part, but on the inside still harboring sin. Church has always been, church and Christianity has long been used as a cover-up for people to hide who they really are. People who have no interest in changing, people who have no hatred for sin, no real love for God, just an outward show. And that kind of hypocrisy is going to prove to be useless, guys in the long run. Coming to church and playing pretend will not work forever. You can keep it secret here. You can keep it secret from me. See, because I'm not all-knowing. Just kidding, I am. <laughs> no. I can't see into your heart. I'm not God. So you can keep stuff secret from me and from us. We don't know what kind of life you live when you leave these doors. We, we don't know what's going on inside your mind and heart. For all I know, there could be people right here in this room that hate us. They're just looking for a way out. They cherish sin. We don't know. But I tell you that though you can keep it secret from us, you can't keep it secret forever. So hypocrisy proves to be useless in the long run when your most private thoughts and actions become most public. And they will. In time, they will. Look at what he says in verse 2. He says, There is nothing covered that will not be revealed or hidden that won't be known. Therefore, whatever you've spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear, in the inner rooms, will be proclaimed 
on the housetop. That's kind of scary. That Jesus who sees what we do and knows what we think is going to somehow or another broadcast this to an audience that makes the Super Bowl television audience pale in comparison. My last newsletter article, I wrote a little bit of the thing concerning the Olympics. I learned that four billion people will have tuned in some point along the way to the Olympics. That's half the world. That's an insane number of TVs. That's a lot of eyes, a lot of people watching Simone Biles do cartwheels. It's insane. And to know that four billion people is just a fraction of everybody who's going to be seeing what you've done and thought and felt. <sighs> Listen, I don't even want you guys knowing what I think sometimes. Do you? Do you want your stuff? Do you want your mind to be suddenly displayed on the TV and we'll just kind of... Sermon's over. Let's tune into like, you know what? You've been thinking all week. Forget it. And Jesus goes, yes, this is what will happen. Therefore, be careful of what you're learning. Be careful of who's teaching you. Be careful of hypocrisy. Don't let yourself be somebody on the outside that you're not on the inside. If you're still corrupt on the inside, be honest about it. Don't fake. See, because here's what happens when people fake it. They become further entrenched in it because the longer they go as a fake, the more they risk in ever coming out as a hypocrite. Every year that passes where you're playing pretend makes it less likely that you'll ever confess and repent of your hypocrisy, thus making it impossible for you to be saved. Why do you think Jesus says, beware? Be careful of this. Be careful of hypocrisy in them. Be careful in, of hypocrisy in yourself. Because, I hate to say it, I, the, the, the true church is not full of hypocrites because born-again individuals are not hypocritical. We are who we are. We know we're sinful. And we don't mind other people knowing that because just watch us, we hate it enough to do battle against it. So there are no true hypocrites in the true church. However, the greater church, and I, I use that term loosely, is full of hypocrites. <laughs> hypocrites have acted, pretended their way up to positions of great influence. Local flu influence, regional, worldwide influence. Pretenders. And that's why Jesus sees them as such a threat. So you've got hypocrites all the way down here from laymen all the way up to the very top. And notice that Jesus warns his own disciples about these hypocrites. Which makes me think, well, if they were susceptible to falling prey to these con men, well then, how much more so are you and I? I mean, I'm no Peter, I'm no Paul, I'm no James. And Jesus is warning James and John of this hypocrisy? We need to be on our toes. And when Jesus says, beware of the leaven, Beware of their teaching. Beware of their influence. He's warning his disciples. He's warning us. I want you to notice that the burden is on you to be careful of what's hypocritical. Not on the hypocrites to stop their hypocrisy. Jesus is warning us. That puts the responsibility on my shoulders and yours. Okay? The Bible is full of warnings for those hypocritical teachers who continue in their hypocrisy but Jesus here is telling those who aren't hypocrites to be careful. So the burden's on you. And we need to be careful. Because as I said, they're actors playing a role and their act is very convincing. But extremely dangerous. And as Christians, we feel the danger, don't we? 
We feel, the, we feel that there are threats out there to our Christianity. There are things out there that threaten the longevity of the church. We feel that. I hope you do. But as a Christian, you feel like this intimidation, this, there's things that threaten. But let me ask you a few questions here. Would you agree with me if I said that the greatest threat to the future of the church in America is the state? The state meaning an over-involved government. Or what if I said the greatest threat to the survival of the Christian in America are the liberals? Or what if I said what, the greatest threat to the existence of Christianity in the United States are the false religions, like atheism, humanism, progressivism, Dr. Philism, Islam? Or what if I said the greatest threat to the spread of the gospel in this country is the modern cultural narrative that we're constantly bombarded with. The one that says acceptance and tolerance. The one that's being preached at you incessantly by pop culture icons through music, and movies, and TV, and universities, and each other. Would you agree with me? Are those things a threat to the church? Are those things a threat to Christianity and Christians and the gospel? Absolutely, they are. I, I hope you see that. But I'll tell you, they're not the greatest threat. You know what the greatest threat to Christianity is? Christianity. A corrupt form of Christianity. A hypocritical version of Christianity. See, the gospel of Christ isn't going to be stopped by atheists or ISIS. It's going to be perverted by so-called Christian teachers and preachers and evangelists. And then it's going to be watered down and distributed worldwide until the true, unadulterated gospel is so rarely heard that when people actually receive the true, unadulterated gospel, they choke on it because they can't stomach it. And then the true preachers of the gospel are going to be branded as radical heretics, and their message will be dismissed. That's what's going to happen. And the guilty party are the Christians. The Christian churches, the Christian authors, the Christian preachers, the Christian pastors. The biggest problem to Christianity in Duluth is not the synagogues or the mosques or the taverns. The biggest threat to Christianity in the Northland are its pastors and priests and worship leaders. And not just the obscure ones tucked away in a little pocket of the community. These are ones who are some of the most high-profile, dominant religious forces in the Northland. Devotion to God, success in the ministry, the approval of the masses, and outward piety are no guarantee that a person actually loves Christ or honors the Lord. Case in point, verses 1 through 3. All these Pharisees needed was a little more exposure to the raw truth of Jesus, and it became quite obvious that all those things were nothing more than show. Hypocrites they were. And I'll tell you very plainly that very similar things would happen in the Twin Ports if Jesus showed up today and exposed a little hypocrisy here. See, the greatest threat to the expansion of the kingdom of God in Israel, first century, wasn't Caesar or the Roman government. It wasn't the lepers and the prostitutes. It wasn't the tax collectors and the sinners. And it wasn't the demon-possessed or the demented. You know who it was? The priests. The scribes. And the Pharisees. The educated. The religious elite. The very ones that no one would have expected had Jesus not come along and said, beware of that guy. They're good actors. 
very, very skilled. Jesus then goes on teaching us in verses 4 and 5 about proper fear. Don't fear man. Now, why would he launch into this fearing man issue? Now, remember, he's talking to his disciples. Why do his disciples need a quick lecture on fearing man? Well, because the disciples had grown up in a culture where they were taught to fear or revere or respect or be ultra-influenced by and controlled through the Pharisaic party. And Jesus is going, don't be afraid of them. Even if they arrest you. Even if they persecute you. Even if they stone you to death. Which, by the way, you know who was a member of the party of the Pharisees at the time that Jesus is denouncing them? A man named Saul. Who would arrest and persecute and stone to death some of Jesus' disciples before becoming Paul and going on to serve the Lord Jesus that he once denied. And so Jesus is warning his disciples, his followers, the committed of these individuals, saying to them, to us, if you're a disciple of Christ, beware of them, don't be afraid of them. They're hypocrites. They don't count. Don't listen to them. Don't be influenced by them. Don't be conned. Don't be tricked. Learn to see beyond the religious veneer that people cover themselves with. What drives a person to such rampant hypocrisy as that? I mean, these guys were just hugely hypocritical. Jesus reserved some of the greatest judgment for these individuals. How did they get there? How does a person go so far that they claim to believe in God, yet by their works deny Him? How does a person go so far in their hypocrisy that they insist that they're a new creature in Christ, yet they're incessantly conformed to this world, rather than to the image of the Christ that they claim to have been saved by? pretending to have made Jesus the Lord of their life, yet being so easily and readily influenced by godless pressures. How does a person get that far? H how does that work? Well, short and sweet, they care what people think of them. That's how you get that bad. You care what people think of you. And you're willing to do whatever you must do to have their approval. If it means be part of the church, serve at the church, do stuff with the church, you'll do it, even though that's not you. If it means smoke and drink and try drugs and party harder than anybody else to get people to like, then that's what you do. Whether it's righteousness or sin, you'll do whatever it takes, and it's not you. Hypocrite. Because that's how that works. If you're offended by this, you've got to understand that Jesus doesn't care. He would rather you know the truth about you so that we can get to work on what's right and true rather than buying into your pretend and playing pretend along with you. Jesus doesn't do that. The Pharisees learned it, didn't they? I guess Jesus isn't one to play pretend. So how do people get that far in? How do they, how do they become such deeply entrenched in their hypocrisy? Well, they care about what people think of them. That's how you get started in it, and it only snowballs from there. They live for the approval of others. Their spiritual security rests on the opinions of everybody else. So they do what they need to do, which includes a good amount of acting, in order to secure a favorable opinion with people, even if it means compromising in their devotion to God. And Jesus calls this fear. That's the word he uses to describe such a, an approach. And it's not just an emotional component either. When we think of fear, oftentimes we think of like scared, right? Freaked out. Like, there is that perhaps. But most importantly, fear of an individual is manifest in who it is in the end that controls your obedience. 
who it is in this life that has the most influence over you. If you're a fearer of man, your life will become one that is entirely shaped by men and women and culture and everything but God. If you fear God, your life will become one that is entirely shaped by what God thinks of you, His opinion of you. And it goes without saying, His opinion is the only one that matters. Because in the end, He alone will be the judge. No one else gets to weigh in then. Mom and Dad aren't going to be there to judge you on Judgment Day. So it doesn't matter what they think and what they want. It matters what God thinks and what God wants, doesn't it? Your friends aren't going to be there on Judgment Day. They're judging you now. Your parents will judge you now. Your culture will judge you now. And many of them will condemn you for doing what God would have you do. So you need to make up your mind right quick as to which path you're going to travel. A, a God-fearing path or a man-fearing path? And the one that fears man is a trap. It ends in a, with a pit. You'll fall into it. Always. You're either preoccupied with what people think of you or you're preoccupied with what God thinks of you. And you know which one you're preoccupied with. All you need to do is pay attention. Everybody chooses. I go so far as to say that everybody chooses on a daily basis who they're going to honor with their fear. Whose approval they're going to commit themselves to winning. You're committed to winning somebody's approval. You choose on a daily basis whose approval that is. You decide who you're going to be most influenced by. You decide whom they will give their obedience to. Everyone chooses whether they will fear God, even to the occasional disapproval and ridicule of men, or fearing men, even to the eternal disapproval of God. It's an inescapable decision. Everyone is always deciding. Each one of us. We either compromise the desires of God in order to fulfill the expectations of other people, or we disappoint even the most influential people in our life in order to meet the expectations of God. Okay, listen to me. You cannot be unflinchingly loyal to God and man at the same time. Sooner or later, every Christian has to deny people they love in order to accept the demands of having Jesus as their Lord. If they don't, they too will prove to be the hypocrites that Jesus denounces. Christ himself said, unless you hate your father, mother, sister, brother, on and on and on, you cannot be my disciple. You will choose who to fear. And none of us in this room is beyond this hypocrisy. If he's telling his disciples these things, then we share the same warning. Be careful. Be careful of hypocrisy. Be careful of hypocrisy in yourself. And be careful of hypocritical Christians who position themselves as dynamic followers of the Lord Jesus Christ when in truth they're opposed to Him. And the burden is on you to find out who they are. I remind you that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. We learned that in verse 1. He's throwing out some very strong cautionary declarations here, isn't he? Everything you say and think is going to be broadcast in the heavens for everybody to see. Ah! God can not only kill you but throw your soul into hell, so you be very careful. Watch out for hypocrites. And I mean, he's just kind of... If I'm one of his disciples hearing him say this firsthand, I'm kind of like, yeah, okay. And then he comes in with verses 6 and 7 to kind of reassure those who, who, are, who are being careful, who are fearing the Lord, walking in the fear of God. 
they don't appreciate hypocrisy and they're trying the best they can to be discerning about who's a hypocrite and who's not. They're fighting it in themselves and they're rejecting it in others. And so Jesus offers these encouraging words. He says, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins and not one of them is forgotten before God? Apparently sparrows were food back then. I don't know what the deal was, but you could buy them at the market for pretty cheap. Very cheap. And Jesus' point is that, as cheap as they are, God knows these sparrows. Now, even though they're dead, being sold at the marketplace, He hasn't forgotten them. Not in their life, not in their death. And then He turns and He says to His disciples, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. There's like over 100,000 hairs on a person's head, average person. I don't... Huh? The, come on, stop it. Yeah, yeah, but you got to understand that they're numbered. Each one has its desig God-designated place. God's that thorough in His keeping track of everything, which may frighten you or reassure you depending on which side of the fence you stand on this morning. I'm rather reassured that God is keeping such close track of me, not in this life only, but also in my death, that He's got me, He's locked me in, He's given me faith, opportunity, He's given me His Holy Spirit. I, we can do this! He's with us! It's not like He just gives you an assignment and goes, good luck to you! Be careful of hypocrites out there. Uh, I'm leaving you to yourself. I hope you do okay. No, he says, I'm with you every step of the way. Jesus is reassuring to his disciples. But then, okay, and here's what I like about how Jesus teaches and how he deals with people. He never pounds you to death with the hardness of the truth. But when you're starting to feel winded by it, he comes in with a little encouragement so we can catch our breath. But he never lets us dwell too long in basking in the wonder of, you know, all oh, my hairs are numbered, Jesus, <laughs> before he takes us right back into the harsh reality of things. So he balances this out very well. And so now, verse 8, he comes back in and says, Also, I say to you, Whoever confesses me before men, him, the Son of Man, will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will also be denied before the angels of God. He's going, you decide. You decide what your future looks like. We went through this recently. You decide how I treat you. You will be treated well, you better treat me well. Well, I didn't know that's how Christianity worked. I thought I could just like do whatever I wanted and he would keep treating me well. I thought I could enrage the Holy Spirit, blaspheme his name, live in continual unrepentant sin, and he loves me. His mercies are new every morning. No. You want to trifle with the Holy Spirit? You want to blaspheme the name? You want to, if that's the game you want to play? You want to play fast and loose with Christianity? He'll forgive me. Are you certain of that? I can build a huge case against that. He will not forgive those who live in unrepentant sin. Are you not reading your Bible or are you just taking what the hypocrites out there have preached to you? Are you taking what American Christian religious leaders and books, you know, that you've read teach you that junk? That you can turn God's grace into lasciviousness, like, like debauchery, you know, that, like just treat it fast and loose. Like uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you know the name, he was constantly preaching against the idea of cheap grace, which means I can live however I want because God is ultra graceful and he'll, he'll accept me in the end because that was what the church in his day in Germany was doling out. And Bonhoeffer came along and he's like, that's ridiculous. 
And so he started writing books against it and preaching against it and refuting it until he got killed for it. Because you know who the greatest threat to Christianity and Christians is? It's the church and it's Christians. False versions of it. Those that would preach that cheap grace. You play fast and loose with the Holy Spirit, he'll kill you. You want to live a, a man-fearing life, God will kill you and then throw you into hell. That's what Jesus just said. You want to deny Jesus in this life? And by the way, denying him, confessing him, what that looks like in the practical and the outward is if you're too embarrassed, if you're too bashful, if you're so afraid of what people will think of you that you tend to keep your mouth shut about it, God help you. Jesus will be embarrassed of you on Judgment Day and he'll keep his mouth shut about you. When God the judge looks at Christ and says, is he with you? Is she with you? Are you their advocate? Jesus is going to go... He's going to speak up for you as much as you've spoken up for him. I don't know, judge. I don't know. Their life was one of timidity and fear. Misplaced fear. Their life was one of disobedience, rebellion. And Jesus says, before, and again, he's talking to his disciples. Twelve men. You, you know who one of them is? It's Judas. So he has every right to speak to his disciples like that. It's not like he's out of line. There was a small number of them in the midst who needed to hear this. There always is. In verse 10, he says, Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man... Now, he's referring to himself, by the way. When he says Son of Man or Son of God, he's referring to himself. He says, Anyone who speaks a word against me, that'll be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. This is interesting to me because um, we believe in a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and oftentimes we, without knowing it, rank them. <laughs> we rank them as far as their importance goes, their authority, like their, mm, their power. Eh? And so we tend to put God at the top, and then a close second, we don't want to dishonor Jesus, but, a, but if you had to rank them, then the close second then would be Jesus, okay? Always at the bottom of the pile is the Holy Spirit somewhere. We just kind of treat him like, ah, eh, you know, he's the Holy Spirit. I don't know much about him. Um, in some, like, evangelistic, non-denominational churches, they might actually put Jesus at the top, make a bigger deal about Jesus than about God, and so it goes Jesus, God, but always, again, Holy Spirit's at the bottom. Okay? At least, it seems to be that way often. The third member of the Trinity is perhaps seen as the least threatening of them all. But it's interesting, isn't it, that the sin which carries the most severe penalty of any is the one that's committed against him. Not against Jesus. Not against God the Father. But you trifle with the Holy Spirit, you lose. <laughs>